Deep in the Pisgah National Forest, among the Blue Ridge Mountains, Brown Mountain rises on the border of Burke and Caldwell Counties in western North Carolina. While this mountain at first glance seems to be nothing but an ordinary, if not dull, low rise amongst more prominent mountains, Brown Mountain was the location of the famous Brown Mountain Lights. The first official sighting of the Brown Mountain Lights came in 1912 as they appeared on the horizon of Brown Mountain seemingly at the same time every night. These mysterious red tinted lights would haunt the nearby residents until in 1922 U.S. Geological Survey investigation led by George Mansfield determined that the lights were simply trains, car lights, and brush fires. Interestingly, the first published mention of the Brown Mountain Lights comes from the Jules Verne novel Master of the World, which was released in 1911. In this novel, the newly expanded electric system causes strange lights to appear on top of Brown Mountain. Then, in 1912, official reports began coming in with witnesses claiming they had seen the mysterious Brown Mountain Lights. For the next decade, the Brown Mountain Lights were being seen by multitudes of people, enough for the United States government to take notice. Once the media got a hold of the Brown Mountain Lights mystery, their investigations and interviews led them on a slightly different path than the U.S. government. Even though no official reports of the Brown Mountain Lights had been submitted until 1912, when asked, some longtime residents said they had experiences with the lights before the official sightings. Moreover, some of them told oral stories passed down from generation to generation of Civil War soldiers experiencing the lights some 50 years before the official sightings. There was a disconnect between the government's stance and the stories of the residents near Brown Mountain. Now, as the justice system has proven, eyewitnesses are extremely unreliable at best, but it seemed as if these stories of older sightings had been heard by enough people that it warranted being taken into account. At the very least, a weird parallel was being drawn between Jules Verne's novel and real life. Not even a few years into the Brown Mountain Lights phenomenon, the locals had ruffled enough feathers in Congress which is an exact parallel to Jules Verne's novel that the U.S. Geological Survey sent D.B. Sterrett to the Brown Mountain area to investigate the lights in 1913. Sterrett traveled to Lovins Hotel, which is just west of Brown Mountain. It looks over the mountain into the lower Catawba Valley. Lovins Hotel had been a popular spot for the mysterious lights due to its elevation and proximity to Brown Mountain. The same year that Sterrett went to investigate the lights, a popular sighting from a local resident claimed that they saw the lights, which were a red tint in color, and they appeared at exactly 7.30 p.m. and 10 p.m., as if on a schedule. This eyewitness account led Sterrett to the conclusion, after looking out over the valley himself, that headlights from westbound trains in the valley were not only visible from Lubbins Hotel, but would explain the lights appearing at specific times of the night over Brown Mountain. He even cross-checked the sightings with known train schedules and found that the schedules matched the time of the sightings. After taking all this into account, Sterrett determined that the Brown Mountain lights were simply man-made, mostly from trains. So that was that. For a few years. In 1916, a flood caused trains in the area to stop for some time. Locals, along with the owner of the Lovins Hotel, swore that the lights over Brown Mountain continued to show up every night even though the trains had stopped. While this might seem more than strange, there could have been other man-made lights that were seen during this period, like car headlights or brush fires. But the public didn't see it that way, so they convinced the government to send out another agent to investigate the lights. This time, George Mansfield arrived from the USGS to quell the public in 1922. He was armed with something that Sterrett wasn't, however, an Allidade telescope. For those unfamiliar, an Allidade telescope allows the user to sight an object at distance and then locate that object and the angle it creates to scientifically measure where the brown mountain lights were coming from. Mansfield set up his telescope near Lovins Hotel 
and recorded what he saw over a few nights. He plotted several lights that he saw over Brown Mountain and each of them had a corresponding explanation behind them. One had come from a curve in a railroad track, which after checking train schedules had been confirmed to be a train headlight. Mansfield found other lights that turned out to be brush fires and car headlights. Joseph Lovin, the owner of the Lovin Hotel, pushed back on Mansfield, claiming that the lights they saw those three nights were not true Brown Mountain lights. He told Mansfield they weren't bright enough to be the real phenomenon. Nonetheless, Mansfield stuck to his theory and explanation for the mysterious Brown Mountain lights. They were indeed man-made lights from trains, cars, and fires. Oddly, after Mansfield and Lovin spent time together, Lovin dropped off from the public eye, never again speaking about the lights. Some take this as a sign that he felt Mansfield had solved the mystery of the Brown Mountain Lights. As far as the U.S. government was concerned, the Brown Mountain Lights mystery had been solved. But others not only believed, but tried to take matters into their own hands to revive the mystery themselves. Sometimes, people can get wrapped up in the adrenaline of being in the middle of a mystery, and I think that's what happened to the people who allegedly claimed that their ancestors had seen the Brown Mountain Lights. At least those stories that dated further back than the Civil War. The rumor of the Cherokee spotting the Brown Mountain Lights seems to have come from a publication nearly 20 years after the Brown Mountain Lights mystery had been solved. In 1938, the Asheville Citizen claimed the Cherokee had spotted the lights long before us, but left no evidence to back that up, and experts on the Cherokee vehemently deny that to be true in any way. But what about those who claim that their ancestors saw the lights during the Civil War? Well, they could have been telling the truth, as the Western North Carolina Railroad ran through the Catawba Valley before and during the Civil War. So, it is quite possible that ever since the building of the Western North Carolina Railroads in the Catawba Valley, people have been seeing the Brown Mountain Lights. Appalachian State University has done a significant amount of research on the Brown Mountain Lights phenomenon. They had two cameras installed that overlooked Brown Mountain and Linville Gorge. By the time 2014 came around, those cameras had recorded and analyzed over 6,300 hours of data without any unexplainable lights being captured. So what if you want to go see the Brown Mountain Lights? Well, first of all, there's no guarantee that you will see any lights, but there are a couple places you can visit to try and spot them. At mile markers 301 and 310 on the Blue Ridge Parkway, you can get a good view of where the lights might show up. Also, at the Brown Mountain Overlook along the North Carolina Highway 181 near Jonas Ridge, you might have a chance to see them as well. The Brown Mountain Lights have, as I believe, been solved. There is no doubt that there is a lot in the Appalachian Mountains that we cannot explain. But this is not one of those mysteries. The fact that Mansfield was able to figure out the real story behind the Brown Mountain Lights is just as exciting as if they were left unexplained. Even though the lights have been explained, they are prominent peaks in pop culture. Songs have been written about them, a movie plot formed from them, and they even made it into the X-Files TV show. <laughs>